Thank you for joining me as we continue in our current series of study called Wife versus Female. Now, this segment is part four, and it is entitled The Truth About Women in Ministry. And as we continue our study, we're going to delve deeper into the three scripture passages which we focused on in parts two and three, where we conducted a study of the key words in those passages. And again, those three controversial passages of scripture are 1 Corinthians 11 verses 3 to 12, 1 Timothy 2 verses 11 to 15, and 1 Corinthians 14 uh, verse 34. Now, these verses have been used by some to say that in their religious assemblies, women are not able to serve as apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And although it may be true that they are able to decide who is able to serve them in their religious assemblies, Mankind is not able to decide who the Most High has called to serve him in his assembly, which is the body of Messiah Yahusha, the Christ, who is commonly known as Jesus. However, in our studies, we will use his Hebrew name, which is Yahusha. And you know, others have said that if women are called to teach, they're only called to teach other women. But never should a woman teach a man as pertains to matters of scripture. And these three scripture passages, along with perhaps other passages, have been used to de defend their doctrine of prohibition. In addition, this era of doctrine is, is used to support the conclusion that some have come to who say that the New Testament in general and writings of Paul in particular contradicts itself when nothing could be further from the truth. Any seeming contradiction is simply an opportunity to gain proper understanding. What we saw in parts two and three of our study is that translation bias has certainly played a significant role in this era in doctrine. And in this segment, we will see some other important matters that have been ignored by those who align themselves with the, um, these doctrines which attempt to limit women and their response to the Most High's call to ministry. And so as a matter of brief review, we found that um, these three passages have something in common, and that is that they were all three taken from letters written by the Apostle Paul. And although these letters were most certainly inspired by the Spirit of the Most High and are drawn from eternal principles of truth, they were written with specific instructions. addressing specific problems. Among the newly formed assemblies in a specific area, and among a specific group of people at a specific time. Because in Galatians 2.8, Paul says, um, he tells us that while Peter was called to be an apostle to the Hebrews. He, Paul, was called to be an apostle to the Gentiles. 
end of quote. Now, each group of people has a different history and each has some specific needs for a course of action which is aimed at bringing them out of either legalism, more specifically in the case of some of the Hebrews, or on the other hand, some variation of pagan religious traditions which existed among Hellenized Hebrews and more specifically Gentiles. And we will look more closely at that in this segment. Now, as we look at this map, we see some of the major cities that Paul was called to serve. We recognize some of the cities as ones that Paul wrote letters to. Now, we know that Paul wrote these letters to local leaders of those local assemblies as he also traveled to meet with the, with the assemblies. And in the midst of these cities, we see the two cities to which the three letters were written. The two letters written to the Corinthians and the letter written to Timothy in Ephesus. Now, Ephesus was a very prominent city in the Roman Empire. So let's look at some historical context for our scripture passages. One of the reasons for the prominence of Ephesus as a city in the Roman Empire was that it was the location of the Temple of Artemis. And for us today, as we read some of Paul's letters, without knowing it, we're actually reading about some of the pagan beliefs and rituals of the cult of Artemis. For example, hair braided and the wearing of pearls and gold was a common style worn by priestesses of the cult of Artemis as a, a means by which to flaunt their wealth. And by the way, Diana was the name used by the Romans for this false goddess and Artemis was the name used by the Greeks for this same false goddess. We see mention made of Artemis in Acts 19 verses 23 to 41 where the citizens of Ephesus were upset by the preaching of the good news of the kingdom because there was a stronghold of pagan idolatry in the city which was bolstered by the fact that the temple of Artemis was located in Ephesus and it was a tourist center that drew people from around the world. In fact, at one point, this temple was known as one of the seven wonders of the world. And not only was lots of money made in the sale of idols here, the building was actually used as a bank because they believed that no one would dare steal from it. In today's world, it has been referred to as the Wall Street of that time. Now, this cult of Artemis, which administered this pagan temple, was a female-dominated cult, which taught that women were superior to men and that women were created first. Also, Artemis was supposedly the goddess of fertility and guardian over childbirth. Since they believed that Artemis assisted her mother in delivering her twin brother, Apollo. Now, the city of Corinth was also a prominent city. Um, 
Corinth was known for its wealth stemming from its strategic location on this small strip of land that was important to traders and travelers. The temple of the pagan false goddess Aphrodite was prominent in the city of Corinth. There is archaeological evidence that there was a practice of temple prostitution at the temple of Aphrodite, where these prostitutes had very rich clients, and this prostitution was a part of their worship to this false goddess. Fornication was rampant throughout the city of Corinth. And in addition to Aphrodite, there was another false god worshipped in Corinth, and it was the false god Dionysus, whose female worshippers would dress as men and either cut their hair very short, which is a, a descriptive of a term known as shorn, or they would shave their heads, which means that they had shaven heads, and that would be what the female uh, worshippers, um, how they would conduct themselves. On the other hand, the men would wear their hair long and wear veils as they dressed as women. Um, there have been vases discovered which depicted this practice, and these vases were found in Corinth. Now, are we starting to, to hear some things that Paul was very specifically speaking to? Braided hair with pearls and gold, women superior to men, women created before men, childbirth concerns, hair shaven, hair shorn, women dressed as men, men dressed as women, men wearing veils, women with shaven or shorn heads uncovered. These are all terms or phrases um, that we're, we're going to see addressed in various places, not only in these three um, passages of scripture that we've been looking at, but as well in other places as well, like in, in Romans and uh, Ephesians. So, okay, let's continue. Now, something else that we found in parts two and three of our study is that in the original text, all three passages contain the words husbands and wives, which have been translated most commonly as men and women in English. We also discovered that there are actually Greek words in the original text that specifically distinguish gender as male and female. And that Paul actually used those words, male and female, in other places in scripture where he wanted to make that distinction but Paul did not use those words anywhere in these three passages. So as to say that his statements in these passages were focused on gender. And so our approach has been to conduct a word study which we did in parts two and three. And then we began this segment with the discovery of some historical context of these three scripture passages.
And as we move forward in this segment, we will look closer at the scriptural context of these passages and allow scripture to interpret scripture. So let's begin. Let's begin with 1 Corinthians 11 verses 3 to 12 and, uh, and read verses 1 and 2 of this passage to give us uh, more insight from the context. So we will read 1 Corinthians 11 verses 1 and 2 and then continue with verses 3 to 12. So, 1 Corinthians 11, verses 1 to 2. Uh, be imitators of me, just as I also am of Messiah. Now I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the traditions just as I handed them down to you. End of quote. And so, here I have underlined the word tradition because it is a key word in understanding something about the verses that follow in verses 3 to 12, which is um, the first of the three passages that we're, that we're currently studying. And so the word tradition is Strong's number G. 3862. And so let's take a look at a definition for tradition. And so Strong's defines this word tradition as a transmission, um, that which is an act of transferring something from one spot to another or from one generation to another. In general terms, this word tradition makes reference to a habitual practice or manner of behavior. And when we think about it, traditions actually serve to transmit the culture of a body of thought or belief from one generation to another. And having transmitted as a tradition, this then becomes a visual reminder of an invisible spiritual principle, whether for good or for bad. Now, the majority of times that we see this word tradition in the New Testament, it is used in such a way as to contrast the traditions of man versus the commandments of the Most High. And so it would seem that all traditions are bad. However, um, in the verses following this passage, Paul is going to be talking about head coverings. And an important point to understand is that in the verses we just read, he clearly points to the fact that there is a tradition that he's going to be discussing. And inasmuch as it is a matter of tradition, the Gentiles would have been familiar with the customs and tradition of head coverings as they would have seen the customs of the Hebrews. And so as a matter of providing a teaching by means of illustration and a course of action with specific aims for those coming out of the Greek and Roman cults, Paul used the matter of the tradition of head coverings as a specific remedy a specific remedy for disassociating themselves 
from the ideology and identity of the religious cults of mythology. Also, what we're going to see is that in this letter to the Corinthians, Paul, an apostle to the Gentiles, is going to use that tradition of head coverings so as to illustrate a, a weightier matter of headship as it is prescribed by the Most High to exist both in the home and as it is prescribed by the Most High to exist in the Most High's house, which is the body of Messiah. And so again, it is with the apostolic authority that was given to them by the Almighty that the apostles were providing traditions, which are, again, intended to be carriers of thought or belief demonstrated in habitual behavior. Now, there is nowhere in the law and the prophets um, or what's commonly called the Old Testament, that head coverings were commanded. And so even if the tradition of head coverings has not carried over to us today, the spiritual principle of modesty yet remains. And it remains for us to be demonstrated in the way that we dress today. The tradition of head coverings was given to the Gentiles at that time as a means by which to separate themselves from the ideology and the identity of their former affiliation with the cults of Greek and Roman mythology. Now, on the other hand, even if some of the religious traditions of the Pharisees don't exist amongst believers today, spiritual wickedness is yet conveyed or transmitted by the traditions of the world, which have been unwittingly accepted by the church, by the called out assembly, the body of Messiah. With, uh, for example, the tradition of Easter eggs and bunnies, which memorialize the false god of Ishtar, rather than the risen Savior, our Messiah, Yahusha. And so it is important that we examine and are mindful of what traditions we memorialize and what is the true spirit behind it? And so again, when we look at this letter to the Corinthians, we see that Paul eagerly embraces his call to minister the good news of the kingdom to those he has been called to serve. And as he is addressing the assembly at Corinth, which is largely made up of new believers from a Greek religious and cultural background, Paul renders a Hebraic understanding of the renewed covenant in a very profound way. When speaking to the various assemblies, he speaks like, Moshe or Moses spoke to the Hebrews, providing guidance and correction to those who have little or no insight into the Torah, the law, the teaching and instructions of the Most High. And so let's look at the next part of our, our passage. Now, let's move on to verses 3 to 7. So again, that's 1 Corinthians 
um, chapter 11, verses 3 to 7. Reading, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Messiah, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Messiah is Elohim, God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman that prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, dishonors her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. But if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, forasmuch as he is the image and glory of Elohim, or God. But the woman is the glory of the man." End of quote. Now, let's read this passage with what we learned from our word study in parts two and three. Let's do that. So again, we're reading the exact same passage, 1 Corinthians 11, verses 3 to 7. We'll read verses 8 to 12 in just a moment, but we're breaking it up so as to have it all fit on one screen at one time. So now we're reading verses 3 to 7, and we're um, implementing that which we found in our word study. Uh, now remember, in our word study, we learned that the word commonly translated as woman in this passage is more accurately translated wife. And the word most commonly translated as man is more accurately translated as husband. And so let's read it with that understanding. Okay. But I would have you know that the head of every husband is Messiah, and the head of the wife is the husband, and the head of Messiah is Elohim. Every husband praying or prophesying having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every wife that prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, dishonors her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the wife be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a wife to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a husband indeed ought not to cover his head. For as much as he is the image and glory of Elohim, or God, but the wife is the glory of the husband. End of quote. Okay, so now, first of all, there is a phrase in this passage that we must pay attention to, and that phrase is praying and prophesying. Now, the significance of this phrase makes the distinction uh, of the Most High's house, as opposed to the natural family house. Because what is being said to us here is that 
In the natural family house, the husband is the head of the wife, and Messiah is the head of the husband, and the Most High is the head of Messiah. However, in the Most High's house, whether one is going in to the house in prayer or one is coming out of the house with prophecy, Messiah is the door. In fact, Messiah is the only way in and out of the presence of the Father. We don't enter in by means of any other man or woman, not a husband or a pastor or an elder or any other person. And so that's why when the wife prays or prophesies, she is instructed to cover her husband because when praying and prophesying, her head is Messiah. In fact, if while praying or prophesying, she does not cover her husband, it's like spiritual adultery because she has someone else as her head. Because in fact, when praying or prophesying, Messiah is the husband to both the natural husband and the natural wife. Because in Galatians 3, verse 27 to 28, we read, for as many of you as have been baptized or immersed into Messiah have put on Messiah. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Messiah Yahusha. End of quote. And then we have Romans 1 9. And again, this is Paul speaking. For Elohim is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit and the good news of his son. End of quote. And so here Paul makes it very clear. Uh, Gender is not involved uh, in serving the Most High. It, we serve with our spirit. Revelations 19 verses 7 to 9. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. End of quote. Now, in this verse in Revelations, um, the her that is spoken of is the bride of Messiah, which is made up of those who according to the flesh, are both male and female. But according to the spirit, neither male nor female. And you know, I don't think there is a male believer who would say that he does not desire to be counted as part of those called the Bride of Messiah. Now, let's read a couple of other verses which speak of this same matter and um, allow Scripture, again, to interpret Scripture. So let's uh, read Ephesians 5, verses 19 to 25. 
speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, the Master, giving thanks always for all things unto Elohim and the Father in the name of our Master, our Lord, Messiah, Yahusha, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of Elohim, the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Messiah is the head of the assembly, the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Messiah, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives even as Messiah also loved the church and gave himself for it. End of quote. And so this passage bears witness that um, in the passage that we just read, which again was 1 Corinthians 11 verses 3, uh, it's taken from uh, verses 3 to 12, I think we read, read verses 3 to 7, Paul is speaking of husband and wives and not men and women in general, as we first read in the most common translation of that passage. Here the translators translated the very same uh, words from the original text, but instead translated the words as men and women. I'm sorry, translate the, the words that they had translated as men and women. In this case, they translated as husband and wives. And you know, actually, even if you didn't have a Strong's Concordance to look up these words, I think that we would we would have been able to see the answer to this question. Uh, I think that the only way that this question um, of whether a man is the head of every woman or not is a difficult question is uh, if you pose the question to uh, a seminarian um, prepared theologian. Uh, then it becomes a difficult question to answer. However, if you pose that question um, to any wife who's not been prepared by some seminary, uh, I would venture to say that in most cases, uh, the wife would have no difficulty at all in, in giving us an answer and saying, no, that her husband is not the head of any other house other than their own. Now, I, I believe that, um, and this is just my own personal opinion, I believe that most men who would um, believe that men, all men, or the heads of all women may have somewhat of a Solomon complex. You know, Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And so it sounds like he wanted to be the head of every woman. But uh, we need only to ask Solomon how that worked out for him. Okay. Well, again, thank you for the opportunity to um, express my own personal opinion, uh, knowing that my opinion doesn't count for anything. Um, so let's just get back to what scripture says.
Let's read another passage, Ephesians 1, verses 19 to 20, 23. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who are believing according to the working of his mighty strength, which he wrought or worked in the Messiah when he raised him from the dead? and seated him at his right hand in the heavenlies, far above all rule and authority and power and mastery and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all under his feet and gave him to be head over all to the assembly, which is his body, the completeness of him who fills all in all. Messiah is head over his entire body. Let's think about that for a moment. Messiah is head over his entire body. Also, this, this, um, this particular passage also speaks to, um, and I don't think we've gotten to the, this part of the passage yet, but there's a part of the passage that's coming up, uh, out of that passage of 1 Corinthians 11, verses 3 to 12, we've only read up uh, to, pay, uh, to uh, verse 7, 3 to 7, but somewhere between 8 and 12, there's going to be um, a point made that women or wives uh, need to have power on their heads because of the angels or messengers. And so again, it points to um, the authority um, that is authority over all is found in Messiah as head over his body, his entire body. Ephesians 4, verses 15 to 16. But maintaining the truth in love, we grow up in all respects into him who is the head, Messiah, from whom the entire body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the working by which each part does its share, causes growth of the body for the building up of itself in love." End of quote. So, again, here we see that there is a growth into the head. And so, if Messiah is not the head of the woman, then there is no growth into the head. Clearly, here, let's read this uh, again. Ephesians 4, verses 15 to 16. But maintaining the truth in love, we grow up in all respects into him, Messiah, who is the head, Messiah, from whom the entire body joined and knit together by whom every joint supplies, according to the working by which each part does its share, causes growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. End of quote. And then there's um, Genesis or Bereshit 1 verses 27 and 28. Then 
Elohim, or God, said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So, Elohim created man in his own image. In the image of Elohim, he created him. Male and female, he created them. End of quote. And so, as we can see here, um, the creation, uh, the original creation was such that mankind, male and female, were created in the image and likeness of Elohim. And so, um, the wife to Adam the male was taken from his body. And of course we saw, we see that in scripture as well. And uh, perhaps we'll go more into that um, in the next segment of our study um, where um, the order of creation um, is, it actually becomes a, a matter um, that is spoken of in one of the points of one of the three um, passages that we're currently studying. But in any case, this verse speaks to that verse about um, within the, the segment of the passage that we just read of 1 Corinthians 11 verses 3 to 7 uh, where it talks about how the wife is the glory of the husband. Okay, so it um, does not say that the wife is in the image of the husband, but the glory of the husband. And, um, and of course, we have other verses in scripture that make reference to uh, a virtuous woman or wife who uh, makes her husband known in the gates of the city. And he who finds a, a wife finds a good thing. And um, so that's what is being uh, made reference to is uh, the kind of, of um, um, influence that a, a, a woman, a virtuous woman, has and plays a role in in the husband's life and so um but again we uh, are looking here at the fact that both husband and wife male and female um were in fact um created originally uh before the fall in the image of Elohim. God. And after the fall, uh, we see in uh, Genesis chapter 5, I believe it is, where it talks about after the fall, all of mankind was affected by that fall in as much as um, the um, scarring of the image uh, of man and that being passed on uh, throughout the lineage of the first Adam, which would be um, all of mankind then. But of course, our Messiah coming and restoring mankind, male and female, into the image of Messiah, the image of the, the Word, um, working the Word in our lives. And um, and so this verse makes reference or, or clarifies uh, what we just read. Let's see, there are two more verses here 
that we want to be sure to cover. And then um, there is a, an illustration that I've prepared to share with you. I'm a very visual person and so um, this is something that will help us to visualize what is being said to us. Uh, but let's first uh, read these two verses here. Uh, these two verses uh, bear witness of uh, that part of the passage that talks about how um, the Most High, Elohim, is the head of Messiah. So let's read 1 Corinthians 3, verse 23. And you belong to Messiah, and Messiah belongs to Elohim. End of quote. And then John 14, verse 28. You heard that I said to you, I am going away, and I am coming to you. If you did love me, you would have rejoiced that I said, I am going to the Father. For my father is greater than I. End of quote. And so again, another verse that bears witness of what we just read about um, Elohim being the head of Messiah. And so now this illustration. We're going to go through a, just a, a couple of the slides um, because what we want to look at, what we want to use this um, for is to, to clarify uh, something that's being said to us here. So we're just going to go through uh, a couple of the verses here. Let's start again with 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every husband is Messiah, and the head of the wife is the husband, and the head of Messiah is Elohim." End of quote. And so, as we can see from, um, from this verse, um, at this point, uh, Paul is not actually talking about head coverings. Uh, he's not talking about a piece of cloth or a hat. He's talking about headship. Okay. And, um, and so he first defines um, what this hierarchy looks like uh, in verse 3. And then let's move forward. In verse 4, he speaks of the husband first, and he says, Every husband praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. And so again, looking at the hierarchy, we see that the husband is the head of the wife, Messiah is the head of the husband, and Elohim is the head of Messiah. Okay, and this verse um, has just given us to know that every husband praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. So what he's saying here is very specific having to do with praying or prophesying, okay? And so he says, every husband praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. So what does that actually look like? That's what that looks like. And so why is that dishonoring to his head? Because Messiah is the head of the husband. 
And so when the husband is praying or prophesying, it's dishonoring to Messiah, the head of the husband, that he be covered. Uh, because actually, uh, Messiah is the way to the Father, the only way to the Father. And so covering or hiding um, Messiah is dishonoring to Messiah. Let's move on to 1 Corinthians 11, verses 5 to 6. But every wife that prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the wife be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a wife to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. End of quote. Okay, so let's take a look here and um, let's see what that looks like. Because again, the husband is the head of the wife and the head of the husband is Messiah. The head of Messiah is Elohim. However, when we are uh, very specific in what we just read here, we're speaking here, Paul is giving to us instructions, apostolic instructions as it, as it pertains to what happens or what it should look like when praying or prophesying. Every wife that prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. So, it's saying here that if the husband is the head of the wife, and that's what Paul uh, first gave us to know in verse 3, uh, the husband is the head of the wife, and um, but goes on to say that if the wife, while praying or prophesies, prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, she dishonors her head. So the reason for that, again, is that um, the wife of necessity must cover her husband cover her head so as to reach Messiah, who again is the door. He is the way. He is the only way to the Father. And, um, and wives do not have some other way through mankind to get to uh the Father, but rather all of the body of Messiah has the same spiritual head and that head being Messiah. And so if the wife, when praying or prophesying, does not cover her head, her husband, it is dishonoring to him. Um, it is as if um, she is committing adultery. And that's what we see illustrated here um, with the um, reference made to uh, hair being shaven or shorn. Uh, remember early on 
we talked about how there were those who were of Corinth who uh, shaved their heads uh, as women, wives. They shaved their heads or they cut their hair really short, shorn, um, as part of their uh, worship of the false idol uh, that they were worshiping. And so that would be like spiritual adultery, and it would be dishonoring. And so here we have the last segment of um, our passage, 1 Corinthians 11, verses 3 to 12. And so we've looked at verses 7, I'm sorry, 3 to 7, and what remains is this segment here, um, verses 8 to 12. So let's read that together. For the husband is not of the wife, but the wife of the husband. Neither was the husband created for the wife, but the wife for the husband. For this cause ought the wife to have power on her head because of the angels or messengers. Nevertheless, neither is the husband without the wife, neither the wife without the husband in the Lord. For as the wife is of the husband, even so is the husband also by the wife, but all things of Elohim, end of quote. And so in this verse, we uh, see um, that Paul is actually addressing something that we first discussed at the very top of this video, and uh, that has to do with um, some of the beliefs of the, the cult uh, of Artemis, where um, one of the beliefs was that women were created first. And Paul is very clearly saying here, no, um, the husband, because Adam and, and Eve uh, we think of them as the first man and woman, but they were the first husband and wife. And uh, because they were born uh, to have covenant relation, they were born, they were created to have covenant relationship. And um, and so they were in, indeed the first husband and wife. And, um, and so what Paul is saying here is that that... Um, account of creation that comes by way of Greek mythology that says that women were created first is not correct. And so Paul is correcting that in this passage. Um, but he also includes here that um, even though um, the husband was um, created first and the wife taken out of the husband, Eve taken out of, of Adam, that um, then beyond that, that um, husbands or all of, of, of uh, the children uh, going forward from generation to generation comes forth through uh, the wife, um, which is the woman. And of course, um, this is something that is done in the covenant of marriage before the Most High. And um, as, as has been prescribed. And so he's saying that um, they're, you know, to be well balanced and, and taking a look at, at, at um, the, not only the, uh, creation account, but then um, the way that the Most High, Elohim, has um, arranged the creation is that 
um, after having created the husband and then taking the wife out of the husband um, that then, you know, by means of childbirth, um, all others come through the wife or the woman, you know, and um, and so he's 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 speaking the truth about uh, creation uh, and putting uh, he's he's putting aside uh, extinguishing the lies of the of of Greek mythology that says. Um, something other than what creation actually says to us. He also takes opportunity in, in this verse as well to talk about how wives have need of power on their head because of the angels. And so again, we, we looked at that hierarchy and uh, when looking at that um, hierarchy as it pertains to uh, prayer and prophesying or prophesying that um, it is of, of necessity that Messiah is the head of the wife. He is the head of the body, um, his entire body, uh, inclusive of those who are according to the flesh, male and female, and um, because of the angels, and because Messiah himself um, is uh, above all principality and power. And, um, and so, of necessity, um, we have Messiah as the head of both the husband and the wife as it pertains to prayer and prophecy and uh, the matter of carrying out um, um, the kingdom duties uh, that have been assigned to us by the Most High to be carried out through Messiah. So, we're going to actually talk about this some more in the next segment um, as we go through the other two passages and uh, we'll in fact uh, touch on some of these principles as well because again um, what beco is becoming apparent and will become even more apparent as we go through the other two uh, passages, the other one in, in uh, Corinthians and the, the one uh, letter to Timothy, uh, we're going to see again references made to those um, beliefs um, that um, were being extinguished by the truth um, through the Apostle Paul and his letters. And so it is, scripture tells us that our Messiah is the head of our lives. He is the good shepherd. And whether male or female, whether married or single, Messiah, Christ, is the husband to our souls. Hallelujah. I pray that this message has been a blessing to you. And if so, please subscribe so that you will be notified when other messages are posted. Also, please share this message and include it in your continued scripture studies and scripture study groups. I do look forward to you joining me for part five of our current study. And until then, Hen Ushalom Mishpacha, favor and peace, family.